welcome to The One Inside, an internal family systems podcast. I'm your host, Tammy Sollenberger. I'm excited that you and all of your parts have taken time to be with me and all of my parts. If you are a coach, a client, a therapist, if you are in business or education, and you're curious about the IFS model, you are in the right place. Now, let's see what happens on today's podcast. Hey everyone, on today's episode, I talk with Dr. Nancy Morgan and Travis Schubeck. Nancy is the Director of Life Moves Behavior Health and Training Program, a California agency dedicated to breaking the cycle of homelessness. Nancy introduced IFS into the training curriculum during the 2015-2016 year. Travis is one of the trainees and students who chose to complete his practicum at Life Moves. Travis is working on an IFS manual for case managers who work with this population. Travis states, IFS is an opportunity to get out of my head and into my heart, and he shares a fantastic story of the impact that that had on a relationship that he had with one of his clients. Both Nancy and Travis speak about the power of the IFS model in clinical supervision in working with the homeless population who have been through a lot of trauma and in preventing student therapist burnout. One more note about this episode. We recorded this at the beginning of this COVID crisis and Travis and Nancy are in California. So Travis and I had started chit-chatting just about how they were doing. And so I just, the episode basically starts in the middle of our conversation. So there's a hint of that as we're talking about what's closed and how they're handling what's happening in the homeless population and with um, housing. So just, you know, that's the kind of the context of this episode. Hope everyone's well. Enjoy. Hello. Hi. Good morning. Good morning. So, Travis, why can't you rock climb anymore? Like, are you not allowed to be out in... Oh, yeah. The gyms are closed. Okay. So, you would rock climb at a rock climbing gym? Uh-huh. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Not, like, at rocks, could... like... Right, right. We could... I guess we could do that, but I think a lot of parks are closed, too. So, we'd have I to know. find something private. In New Hampshire, they're starting to talk about that, which I feel kind of a little bit guilty there's a part of me that feels guilty that there's a lot of trails and stuff here and so last week even though we had a stay at home order we have a stay at home but it's but like every people can go out so anyways we went to a a, we hiked and we saw people but we kept our distance and um people were really mad that people were still using the parks and hiking and i was like oh our beaches are closed now Mm mm-hmm yeah. Is, that, is that what's happening with you guys? Like, can't go to the parks and... Um, Travis, is that true over in Oakland? They're, they still have some parks open over here, but now this morning's report came out. Hi, Tammy. Hi. <laughs> Good morning. <laughs> this morning's report came out and said that <clears throat> just even breathing on a mirror that shows the particulates that'll collect in, in the form on the mirror are what can pass COVID. So I think that's probably gonna start closing some of our parks here too. Yeah, I know that you can, my friend got a ticket for parking at the beach. um, So the other day, so um, Mm. yeah, something's being enforced. Yeah. How are you guys doing with all of of this happening? How are you doing, Travis? (laughs) I, I'm doing pretty well, actually. Um, I had to move right, basically right before uh, this all hit and um, it worked out perfectly. My girlfriend and I moved into this new spot. We have a hot tub. I feel really fortunate. I'm kind of treating it as like a spa retreat and still being productive and seeing clients over telehealth. And yeah, it's doing, it's, it's pretty nice. Um, Yeah. I feel pretty fortunate. So doing okay. Yeah. And I've shifted all of my clients to telehealth and we shifted a week before the 
the shelter in place came into effect, we'd done a training on telehealth for all the student therapists. So we were already transitioning over. And then as soon as the shelter in place came into effect, then any clients that still had been expecting a, an in-person session with a student were immediately transitioned to telehealth too. And all of, I don't know if it's something we'll end up talking about, Tammy, but we have shelter sites that uh, are, they span two counties from the top of one county to the bottom of another county. 10 shelter sites filled with people that are all having to shelter in place. You know, six family sites, entire families having to stay in. And sites with like one site, 111 men, male only site, they're all having to shelter in. And um, it's just, it, it, and our, our dedicated uh, site for people identified and diagnosed with severe mental illness, they're all sheltered in. So it's a lot on our case managers. And so what we're trying to do is set up monitors and screens, uh, monitors and Chromebooks, which we were donated to, uh, to put on a table with some chairs around so that student therapists can log milieu hours and be there on the screen for anybody who wants to just come and sit and just talk. So I want to hear about, let's talk about that. And we can always back up and talk about all the cool stuff you guys are doing with IFS, but I would love to hear about what you just said and how you guys are figuring it out because it sounds like you're a little bit of ahead of the game. And so maybe other people who are listening that do the type of work that you guys do can mirror what you're doing. Right. Okay. So why don't you start by telling everybody where you are in the world and then we'll start there. Okay. Well, I'm in Danville, California right now in my back bedroom. That's now my office. (laughs) Danville's in Northern California. Okay. And Travis, where are you? So I'm in Oakland, California, uh, in my bedroom. And yeah, that's where I'm at. <laughs> and how far apart are you guys? Like hours or I don't, because I don't know. Yeah. So Menlo Park, where Life Moves administration office is, is about an hour from me if there were, I mean, it's a little over an hour if there were no traffic. It's about an hour and 45 on any given weekday, typically. Oh my, okay. And then Travis is north, so that's that's directly southwest, and Travis is actually northwest of me in Oakland, so we're a little bit of an odd-shaped triangle. Yeah, it takes me about 45 minutes to get into, to get two life moves uh, without traffic, but like two hours with traffic. So tell me about life moves. Sure. So <clears throat> typically the, what we say about life moves is it's Northern California's largest agency dedicated to breaking the cycle of homelessness. So we have a really unique model where we uh, more, as, as I understand it, it's probably close to half of our funding and is from philanthropists, private donations, and then the rest is through contracts. Now, this can all be changing in the light of these last couple weeks in particular. Um, so I'm not sure if that's still accurate. But we, we have somewhere over 800 or thereabouts people a night that we provide uh, housing to and shelter to. Mm-hmm. But we're in the transitional housing uh, world where it's not permanent housing. So our goal is that families not inherit the legacy burden of being um, homeless. So the goal is one time only and we break the cycle. Mm -hmm. So we have 10 shelter sites and they look just like apartment complexes. And in fact, our goal is to be the nicest looking apartment complex in any particular neighborhood. And so we will have of our 10 sites we'll have six we have six that are dedicated to families and then we have an adult only site that i'd mentioned we have a site dedicated to people who've been diagnosed with severe mental illness we have the nation's second lgbtq plus dedicated site and really wanting to focus on um on risk to the trans community and the individuals that uh, are right now, I think the contract is something like 18 to 24 for people who can be housed in the site, but we're also open to if somebody's younger and or possibly a little older. It just depends on availability. Mm-hmm. 
Um, and the average stay is 120 days, but especially for families, if they're able to really uh, take advantage of the resources that we offer and all the programming, then we'll continue, they'll continue to get extended most likely. It's really good for the stability of the family and keeping the kids in school. And so all of your, all of your homes are now shelter in place, like, is that right? Okay. And yeah. then does that mean that no one new can come in also? Well, um, no, we're still open for, for business, but, um, that's a really good question. And the thing for me is I'm not involved right now. I've been working from home for the last couple of weeks. So I'm missing, I've got so many emails. Um, but what I'm finding that, that I'm appreciating, and it may be to answer your question is, I was reading that our leadership team has done things like um, moved double wide um, I don't know if it's a trailer or exactly what it is. They're, they're trying to move uh, additional um, living spaces onto our, some of our sites that have more space. Wow. Wow. And I don't know if that's just to bring in additional people or if it's to create more space, uh, personal space between existing clients. Right. right. And all of our clients uh, who are elderly or have any sort of physical health issue are getting motel vouchers to be able to stay in separate motel rooms so that they also can have personal space. That's amazing. Mm -hmm. mm. Yeah, our leadership's been pretty exceptional in this area. Mm. And right now, knock on wood, no cases, no identified cases of COVID. So because we could be one of those places that could really be in, in dire straits if it starts to spread in our shelter in place setting. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Is Life Moves, is that connected to your college or how does that, tell me about the connection between those two things. So Life Moves, because it's um, an agency that's covering two counties and providing all of these services for clients, for people who are there, when people go to Life Moves, they're case managed immediately. And at the family sites that have child service coordinators, their children have daycare and that there are numerous supports so that families can be employed gainfully and save money or be looking for work. And the ideal is that they will then be able to amass enough resources to be able to leave and take everything they've got in their room, except in their, in their houses and their apartments, uh, except for the large appliances. They can take furniture, linens, pictures off the wall, because we're donated so many materials. So mm. they get to take it all, and they get to move to their new place and have saved uh, a savings account that saves their money so they don't have to get stable housing and then spend all their money trying to fill the house. Right. So the services are just super intensive. It appeared about 10, 11 years ago to a woman whose husband was a volunteer that, and she was a retiring therapist. She said, this is a perfect training opportunity site. And so with Stanford, Palo Alto University, Alliant University, what used to be Argosy University, doesn't exist anymore, the Wright Institute, UC San Francisco, U, um, University of California. Um, I'm probably forgetting a couple others, but we have all these universities all the way around that have doctoral training programs and Travis is at, at Alliant University. Yeah. And so Travis, what made you decide to, did you start as like an intern there? Or tell me about what happened, your story. Yeah, so I'm actually still an intern there. Um, I remember interviewing with Dr. Morgan and immediately was like, this is the place I, I need to go. And um, I actually, so there's a ranking, a ranking process and I basically only ranked life moves. Um, and then, cause I just loved it so much. I'm like, if I'm going here. <laughs> so. Uh, I love that um, when you're sure you're like, this is my spot. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. This was my spot. And so um, got in and this is my second year now. I stayed on as an alumni um, and I sort of help supervise um, or consult with 
the practicum students that are there that came in last year. Mm. Um, and so I still see clients and mainly I'm working with staff now too. Um, and actually that's part of the IFS journey that I've been doing as well. All right. Do you want to talk about that? I mean, um, you brought it up, so. <laughs> sure. Yeah. Well, um, hmm, where should I start? So I guess I should start with when I first was introduced to IFS. So, um, yeah, d actually during the interview, Dr. Morgan talked about IFS and a light bulb went off for me. Mm. Um, it was just this, I think what resonated with me most was the compassion and inclusivity that the model held. And I think there was a part of me that was really looking for healing. Mm. And so immediately after the interview, I, I wrote her a long email or she invited us to write emails to her about anything else that we wanted to say that maybe we didn't get to cover in the interview. And I, I wrote a long email about how interested I was with IFS. Um, fast forward a little bit, I got the position at Life Moves as an intern there and just started kind of with my feet running. I, I studied IFS. I read the intro to IFS book by um, Dick Schwartz. I wrote a book report on it. I went to Esalen and did the Eye in the Storm workshop um, and then did some other workshops uh, as well with, with Dick, some weekend workshops. And uh, recent, uh, last year, I, I was fortunate enough uh, to get a spot in the IFS Level 1 training and completed that last year, um, thanks to Dr. Morgan. So, yeah, um, it's been quite a journey. And now I'm... Basically, I, I was doing IFS with clients um, last year, more so, and I noticed that, so Dr. Morgan alluded to this earlier, that all the clients that are seen at Life Moves have case managers, right? And so case managers are working with multiple clients, and sometimes clients come in who may be emotionally active, activating for case managers, and so I saw that that was a struggle for case managers as well as clients it affected clients um and this wasn't all case managers but it's a stressful job right mm -hmm. yeah and so parts are up and um i saw a need there and was like well what if we brought ifs to case managers too and so a program director at one of the shelter sites and i who he also did the level one training um, we created a four-week man IFS manual for case managers and are piloting it right now, um, where we were before this shelter in place. Uh, so, so tell me about that. So it's a four-week. Is it kind of like an intro to IFS class kind of thing? Tell me about that. Yeah, yeah. It's basically the the first week is about introducing the model and getting, you know, introducing parts language to clients and with, or to case managers. And um, that usually goes over pretty well. It makes a lot of sense. You know, people are pretty used to saying, oh, part of me really wants to do this, but a part of me doesn't, you know, the polarizations. Um, and it's really geared towards bringing awareness to the fact that we might have multiple parts inside of us that have different stories and narratives and value to them. Um, and then it guides into uh, some part, parts mapping exercises and some journaling exercises with parts um, to really get a picture of the system. And then to begin, uh, it's really an introductory, so to begin to extend curiosity and compassion rather than trying to exile away uh, mm. whatever comes up in the office. Mm. That's great. I love that. Mm -hmm. Is there a part of you that's so disappointed that you can't, working with that right now yeah that's been part of the grief and anticipatory grief that i've been feeling uh yeah. during this time just it was starting to happen we're we're pushing it through leadership getting the okay to start expanding it to multiple sites and then this hit and now it's on the on the back burner but um i'm still hopeful and it, the the drive is still there so mm -hmm. yeah it's just pause. It's not totally eliminated. Right. Yeah. yeah. Just sitting with the stillness for now. Mm. <laughs> Is there parts of you that struggle with sitting with stillness? 
You know, there is an extremely extroverted part of me that loves being social and but I think that there's another part of me that is more introverted that I haven't been paying giving much attention to uh, mm. for a lot of years and I'm giving a lot of love to that part recently so yeah I love that because it's right I think if you're extroverted it's this feels well I guess I'll speak for myself that there's this um this constant like going and being with people and even setting things up to be with people. And um, yeah, I don't think I let my introverted self introverted part come out to play very often. Mm -hmm. My extroverted, yeah. my extroverted part doesn't let her. <laughs> <laughs> right. right. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. I love that. Travis, your college then doesn't teach IFS then the college no, that you go to. Okay. How has it been when you were in your classes or you're with your professors or writing a book report and you're like, IFS is the jam. How's, <laughs> how is that being, how are people responding to that? Surprisingly inviting. I think um, a lot of professors are really, yeah, just open to it. I think uh, it makes sense. I, I think I, I try and present it in a way that like, I mean, it does like the model makes sense and it just kind of just, it just makes sense. But um, yeah, there is some, there's a part of me that like has some fear around it, you know, and, and just cause it's, it's not as widely accepted yet. Um, and at least it's not taught in any schools that I know of. So yeah, but I did hear a teacher talk about it the other day and I was like, wow, that's, wow I can't believe she brought that up and I wonder I, I want to follow up with her actually so yeah sometimes it does feel that like a little bit like we're spreading this like like we're selling Amway or something <laughs> you know what I mean like you have to get on board this Amway thing it's the best thing ever and there's a part of me that that fears that that I don't want to like I guess it's it feels other people's reaction to that if they feel like I'm trying to sell them Amway that they're going to then have this reaction. Right. Well, I have a Who's part. There's anything wrong with a... Amway. I don't really even know <laughs> about that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, I have a part of me that's, uh, there's a part of me that has a more critical eye and I, you know, want to be open to other modalities as well and their effectiveness for different treatments and things like that too. Um, so I think I, I, I share that fear too. I think it's kind of, there's something there for sure thanks for saying that that makes my part feel better <laughs> now nancy you tell me what you do so all the magnificent things that you do what i do is i facilitate a trauma-focused mindfulness-based ifs infused slash informed 46-week practicum training program and though we've referred, we've used the term intern here so far in the interview, um, what I try to do is bring into the program doctoral uh, practicum students who've had at least one year of supervised experience working with clients and ideally high risk clients. Because our clients, you're familiar with the ACEs, Edward mm -hmm. Chubb. So yeah. our average client is about an eight at life moves, really high correlation with a lot of early life trauma. And um, often it, the schools, the schools will teach a lot of theory. The schools will teach a lot, but they don't necessarily, I haven't found yet, teach the student how to access their own re inner resources to work with clients. Yeah. I don't think there's a better modality than IFS to do that because the student really becomes the facilitator of the client's own healing. Mm -hmm. So to come in <clears throat> without at least one year of supervised experience working with clients is to it is overwhelming for students. And I used to have students that were master's level and some were very talented. But what I found across the board is they, they couldn't have life moves be their first experience working with clients yeah. uh, the supervision needs were too great uh, let me let me sort of back up so we've got the 46 week training program what I focus on is trauma uh, that's how it started and everybody gets the body keeps the score 
And then I wanted to be able to support one other modality that I thought would be the most healing and helpful for the students. And when I found IFS in the spring of 2015, um, I, I was on a conference call with a bunch of other therapists who were sort of looking for the ways to promote their private practices. And one woman on the phone said, oh, I only do IFS. And I thought, how could somebody only do something I've never even heard of? And as Travis said, it's been slow coming to the West. It is taking off now, but it was slow. So I immediately got on the computer and started looking and through a real alignment of, of good fortune and the stars, I got into Esalen, the eye in the storm week with Dick. And meanwhile, in those six months between when I first heard IFS and getting to meet Dick and sit in that training, I'd read as much as I could. Mm. And at the training, I was so completely transformed and felt such an embodied shift that for me, all of my hard work in deep psychodynamic, 20 years of mindfulness practices, CBT, DBT, and all kinds of other iterations of the modalities I was relying on, I, I felt like this is the breakthrough. This is the one that's going to take me beyond all of those places where I've been stuck. But the most beautiful thing is it's going to take me back into me and developing my qualities and skills. Mm -hmm. And so I asked Dick, I said, I'm just a beginner, but I run this training program and I really want to introduce this. I feel like I really want to introduce it. How would you feel about that? And he said, as long as it's an introduction, you're just introducing it. And he said, and let me know if I can help with anything. And I came back that January of 2016 and just started sh buying the videos and showing them and talking about the model. But it was all about the students integrating the concepts themselves to learn about their systems and working with their parts. Because that we were able to say is really doing deep work around counter transference. So it's not just a thing. It's what's showing up for you that's getting in the way of you being the most connected, compassionate, you know, calm with the client. So that's, that's how, that's what I do is I, I direct the training program. And it starts with an arc of being really trauma focused. And right now, I just think there's nothing better than IFS to apply to our clients. And yet at the same time, when students come in and they haven't learned it, that's one of my greatest challenges. Because oh, okay. when I present it, their first thought is, how do I use this? And mine is inside, go inside first. And that's a big ask in a training program because the students are already just kind of overwhelmed with all the other requirements of a training program. I was just thinking that as a student, you're so in your head anyways, right? So you're like, okay, I need to memorize these models and all this stuff. And so then it sounds like what you're asking them to do, which makes sense, is something, di is something different. And I could see that that would be, mm -hmm. um, Travis, do you want to speak to how that was for you? Mm -hmm. um, sure. I, well, I, I think I saw, personally, I saw it as an opportunity to get out of my head and like into my heart. Mm -hmm. So um, yes, I agree with you. I think we're so focused on like what's happening in our head. You know, we have to like psychoanalyze or, you know, all, you know, all these things, but to really just sit with yourself and focus on yourself for a little bit is actually a good, nice, nice reprieve. Um, mm -hmm. If you can get that thinking part of you to, to step back and take some space too. Um, so, yeah. I was thinking that, um, so when I was in grad school, we had like internship and practicum and all that good stuff. And then um, it was a three-year program. And so I finished all that stuff up early. And so I had another year. And so mm -hmm. I worked at a psych hospital for mm -hmm. um, people that had been through trauma. So people would fly all over the world and come to the psych hospital and they would stay for weeks. And I worked like the three to 11 shift. And so um I would, people would be in groups all day and then um, they would be out of groups and then they would have to do like their trauma projects and work and we would have to like witness that. And I wasn't prepared at all for that. And it was horrific. And even now, like, I don't know, it's been probably 15 years. Like I still, 
yeah, it still sometimes will have memories of stories that I heard and, and mm. yeah, and, and you have to leave there with all this horrible trauma stories that you would hear and then like work on a paper or something. And it was, mm. it was horrible. <laughs> it was a horrible yeah. experience. <laughs> mm-hmm. yeah. Cause you're working it, it, with, it is hard. Yeah. And I'm guessing that, right. And I wasn't, I wasn't prepared for that. And that's what your students, that's what you're saying is they come in and they're working with the homeless who have probably horrible stories. Otherwise they wouldn't be homeless. Mm-hmm. This is what I love about um, when Dick makes the distinction between empathy and compassion mm-hmm. um, is that I think there's so much possibility there. There's so much hope when you work with compassion and you're, you're able to sit with that and feel that. And I think the clients feel that too. Mm-hmm. And uh, I think part of the hope is that like, you, there's something in me that is able to trust when I'm, you know, when I have my parts separated or when I'm not blended, that the client will find that healing and that I'm just opening mm. doors. And it, I've heard really, really, you know, horrendous stories and just so much trauma. And at the same time, when I go home, I'm like, there's, there's hope here. I appreciate talking about it very much because it's so important to me to bring IFS to the students. My, I, have, I have such love for the students and such gratitude, and it's also a way to pay it forward and know that if there are ways to support the students, those students are going to benefit their clients. And my practicum and internship experience was very similar to yours. In fact, Tammy, that I left the field for several years after I got my doctorate, after all those years of hard work and my dissertation and everything, because I was so disillusioned seeing that even despite our best efforts, there, wasn't, there weren't systems in place to support me knowing how to offer myself in a different way that could be more beneficial to clients and our systems in place in the mental health system were not sufficient to help a client once they'd started doing well in our groups and individual therapy in our partial hospitalization programs and intensive outpatient programs that 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 they would just fail once they got back out in the community and I just thought there has to be a better way and I, I left and I got very involved in Tibetan Buddhism and the study of the mind And I came back into the field and thought, I want to bring this in. And then it was shortly after I found IFS. So it became, for me, it shifted. And the beautiful thing is I'll I'll be 62 in, in a very short amount of time. And I have never, ever, ever been happier in this profession and uh, felt more engaged and more passionate and more dedicated. But the dedication is really to the, to the students to, and I, if I could have, all of my wishes come true, it would be that they would condense down to just one wish of being able to integrate IFS into graduate training programs at sites and in the curriculum so that the focus wasn't on the model for other people first, but the model for students to be able to apply to themselves. I was just going to say, Dr. Morgan's been so amazing at providing those opportunities. Like I said, she was, she part of, I think part of what drew me to IFS was seeing it seeing her self energy and seeing how calm and collected she is and mod- really modeling that sense of self and providing those opportunities to just go forward. So mm-hmm. I'm really thankful. What happens when you're working with students and they aren't interested in doing their own work? Like if they're like, nope, I have to stay in my head because that's, you know, there's all kinds of reasons why we want to stay in our heads. And so this sort of protective. So what happens when you do get that pushback? Right. I always just try to frame it from the perspective of if this is something that can benefit you, then I'm really going to support it in all the ways that we can. And, and often there will be pushback because it's unfamiliar. And as you said, students are so in their heads and they're so busy and they, they want to apply diagnoses and they want to be able to show a certain amount of knowledge and familiarity with um, psychopharmacology, with the DSM, with uh, particular theoretical frameworks. And I, we really don't create the space for that in our site. 
because that doesn't actually impact the potential for a student to learn and grow or for a client to heal. Yeah. So instead of shifting our energy there, it really keeps coming back to the student and their relationship with the client. And I think even for the students who just aren't necessarily warm to it at the beginning, there is a certain transformation that happens and it might just be 5% um, of the person that shifts. But We've, when we do our case presentations now, it's more and more common that the students I supervise, and I supervise from an IFS perspective with the students. There's a, I think their IFS offers so much to the supervision process. And so the students I supervise will be going around and giving their feedback relative to a case presentation. And they'll say, when I heard when I heard you present, I had a part that really came up that was so fearful thinking, what would, what would I do if this were my client? But then I had another part that was so glad that you're so dedicated to this client. Mm -hmm. And so that has started to expand sometimes to the other students where they'll, even if they're not supervised by me, they'll use parts language. Yeah. And so it kind of naturally, organically takes place. What I, one, of, one of the big lessons for me and the big takeaways in a training program that doesn't have all supervisors supervising from an IFS perspective is that those students don't get reinforced to utilize IFS and look in. And I just encountered this with um, a student supervised by another person in the agency who's really stuck with a very difficult client and doesn't know what to do and and that's where my i'm not there to tell another supervisor how to supervise but i sure know what i would do and i sure know that it would be to turn back in and see what's showing up for that student mm -hmm. and what might need some attention for the student to focus on mm -hmm. so it's a it's been a learning experience for me too you know, this is my fifth year now of doing this, and I learn something every single year. And as the program expands, it also has to deal with the challenges associated with growth. And unless everybody's involved at the same level with IFS, it's going to have some potential to actually separate IFS out to only parts of the program. That's the biggest issue is that, that if I were to really sort of synthesize the, the biggest learnings here. One is, I think it's essentially important for students to be able to receive information about IFS and be able to receive the supports to learn how to apply the model or elements of the model to their own growth and development personally and professionally. I think it'll really support them being the amazing therapists that they have the potential to become. And that I'm really clear about. But for a training program, the biggest issue is that there be all members of a training program have some understanding and appreciation for IFS. So it doesn't become a point of conflict between one modality and IFS. And so it really means providing supports and education and never trying to sell it to anybody, mm -hmm. but to be able to present it and support its continuing unfolding in a program. But it is, I could say it'd be easier for me if, as the program grew, the people who I worked with, uh, who are providing supervision, also could be more aligned in, in terms of what IFS can bring. Mm. Uh, the beautiful thing is, I mean, and that's always going to happen as a, a sort of a a front runner, I think of all the years that Dick had said he spent so much time alone just going out and talking about the program. And, and I feel the weight of that myself sometimes in my mm -hmm. role because it'd be easier for me, frankly, if people were more aligned with it. But the really good news is of the contracted therapists that we work with as the program grows, one after the other is starting to get more interested in like the PESI weekend workshops um, that, that are offered uh, recently. Frank Anderson offered one, Jory Applegate. And so I'm getting emails from these supervisors saying, do you know about this person? Is this something you think I should do? And I say, yes. And there's this online circle and that, you know, yes, there are many opportunities for you. 
uh, because they're kind of getting it. They're starting to hear about it more and more. What really shifts a therapist and a supervisor is when the students know about it and say, I'd really like it if you could support me in this. Mm. And so I want to be there to help support the supervisors as they are learning about it. But probably one of the best things that happened was two years ago when we were still doing master's level, allowing master's level students in, we had a really talented young master's level student, Mercedes, and she was so dedicated to IFS that she presented the very first oral presentation in defense in her art therapy program with, on a client applying IFS. And that is a huge risk for her because her program didn't know about it. And she felt so dedicated that she just had to do it this way. She did wonderfully well, great presentation, passed. And then after that, the director, one of the directors of the program, contacted me about where she could get IFS training. Wow. That's so amazing. That, but from the students have, have, you know, it's really from the ground up that we're seeing the change needing to be in effect. Mm, I love that. What's coming up for me as you're talking though, is about how your, your interesting story that after your program, after your experience, you were burned out and you were like, no way, I don't want to be in this field. And that you're actually now almost come like full circle that like your heart is for these students because we know that if we're in self, we're not going to get burned out. And in self, we'll have hope and hope for our clients and hope for the homeless population and hope for the severely mentally ill and the people we so want to help and that that makes such a huge difference and that you personally, I love that. It's like you came, it's like, it's like God or higher power or whatever you want to say, like really used that so that you have this passion to help help the students. Right. I love that. And the more we're in self, the more we will receive guidance. That's how guidance comes. Yeah. And I, I want to... So true. I want to just plant this seed. If there's any time at all for Travis to just share even just a little bit about your experience with the client who had a nine on her aces, um, there, was a, there was a client who we really expected was going to blow right out of a... One of our one of our shelter sites because she was uh, so so challenging to work with and she'd never been able to stay with a therapist more than three times mm -hmm. and Travis was paired with her and Travis if you have anything to say about that experience that I'd love to share yeah so this this client um, I remember waiting about a month almost five weeks. Um, it was kind of no show after no show. We'd be in contact with each other. And um, she would say that something would come up and that she couldn't make it today. And I was starting, a part of me was like, oh, maybe therapy's not right right now. And then another part of me was just like, no, hold, hold in there, hold in there. Just keep going. What if this is a test? Or what if she just doesn't trust you right now? Or you know, so just trying to tune in and just slow things down and open, you know, keep it, keep it warm, open door. Um, by the sixth time she came in and that session was just tears, just flooding the office, the, the therapy room. And um, I remember just being so grateful and that I listened to that part of me that was just saying to wait and just hold out for her. Um, because it really, really paid off. And I began using IFS with her and she took really well to it. She, yeah, was able to get to actually know some of the parts of her that were really, really damaged and what previously she saw as broken um, mm -hmm. now had some value to them and she could actually see as protective. Um, and she could even extend forgiveness to some parts of her and some of the people that had hurt her. And what was, um, hmm. yeah, I just have a lot of emotion with this client. I really care about her a lot. But yeah, so we, we ended up seeing each other for, for about nine months. Um, wow. And so, yeah, which is, yeah, she had seen therapists before. She just, I don't know what it was. She didn't trust or she didn't feel safe. And I think that was one of the biggest uh, transformative pieces of our work together was that just I was just opening the doors in this safe space for her helping create a safe space that she could share um, mm. without judgment and 
with compassion and eventually she was able to build that self for her too and provide that for herself. Yeah, I forgot to say the other book that the students get is the intro to IFS in the training years. So Travis used it in therapy with her and they went through the book and then there's always a question of, is it okay to gift a client or receive gifts from client? But in this case, this client kept coming back to see Travis, which we provide a support of 90 days of continuous support. Once somebody is stably housed, if they want to come back and see their student therapist. And that's because I learned in my early years that that's where clients almost always failed is the first 90 days after they left a program. So Travis, she kept coming back on her own to see Travis. And then there's a point where she needed to transition into community supports. But in order to support her ongoing internal development, Travis asked me if it would be all right if he got her the intro to IFS book. And I was so appreciative of that and knowing how that can be a tool that she'll continue to use as she moves forward in life. Mm -hmm. Travis, do you think one of the... I'm just wondering if one of the differences for you is that you were able to stay more in self and not be, cause you know, I'll speak for myself that some of those, um, you know, I, after, you know, after my intern job, you know, after working there and I moved here and I worked in community mental health with adults with severe um, mental illness. And so, and was trained in DBT. And so I've had some toughies and often it's the parts that I'm, that are triggered in me and then responding. So I'm wondering if, if what was one of the benefits, I guess what I'm trying to say is, do you feel like one of the benefits was your ability to stay in self and not have parts triggered by things that she was kind of throwing at you? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I really believe that. Um, I think IFS, the IFS model really allows for that um, to get out of my head or to get some space from having to try and think about the right thing to say or, um, know what theoretical intervention I need to do at this exact point in time. It just helps me stay in such a moment, in, in such the moment with the client. And I think they really feel that. And it helps me be calm. And yeah. Yeah. Because I think people that have been traumatized, I mean, we know this, people that have been traumatized have really good protectors and really good intuition of like, I can feel that there's a part of you that doesn't like me. And so I'm going to like tap onto mm -hmm. that part and so because they had to for their own survival so it makes sense that you know someone who's had a lot of trauma is going to really see that part of us that doesn't maybe like them or is scared of them or is bringing up some insecurity that they're going to mm -hmm. be aware of that and then that part of them is then going to react mm -hmm. i would just really support anybody who is interested in considering how to start a practicum training program at your site to feel free to contact me. And uh, the other thing I didn't say is my site is entirely 100% privately funded. So there are a lot of people who really appreciate what this site has been able to do and the supports we're able to offer for our clients. And they've come in so we don't have to rely on contracts that require us to diagnose before we can provide services or limit our services to a 50 minute hour. And this really allows the students to learn how to really sense in and trust what is needed for the client right now. And it really is a true, truest, I think, form of client centered therapy there is. Mm. Uh, so I'm really supportive of anybody who wants to get more information about how a sustainable program like this can do a lot of good in the community. And how can people contact you? What would be a good way for them to contact you? My email is dr.nlmorgan at gmail.com. And then my website is www.drnlmorgan.com. And I welcome any interested folks who want to find out if this is something they can do. I'm just going to say to everybody, you can. It's not hard to do. And there are certain things that I'm happy to help people do that I've learned in my process. I also want to say thank you to Travis for being here. Travis and three other alumni from previous years and I all went to the conference last year and spoke, which was really an honor and a privilege. So I really look forward to more opportunities for students to be involved in the conference process and 
to be able to be interviewed by you if that's possible. And Tammy, my ultimate thanks is to you for doing oh. this podcast. Thanks. I would love, thank you, thank you for saying that. And you're very welcome. I love doing this and I would love to have you on again and with other students or I'm, I'm really flexible and how we can support you and get the message out there for what, what you're doing and how other people can do it. Great. Thanks for hanging out today. If you like this episode, make sure you subscribe. And if you really like this episode, share it with a friend and leave a review. You can follow me on Instagram at IFS Tammy and join our community on Facebook at the One Inside Podcast. Talk to you next time. Today's episode was sponsored by Brighter Vision. What's the point of having a beautiful website if it doesn't attract the clients you want to see? As the worldwide leaders of website design for therapists, Brighter Vision sees this issue happen way too often. A nice looking website doesn't equate to a successful website. The truth is, your current website might even be turning off potential clients. That's where Brighter Vision comes in. Brighter Vision's team of website designers will create a website that is centered around attracting and retaining your ideal client so that you can have a nice looking website as well as a successful one. Better yet, Brighter Vision is offering $100 off exclusively for listeners of the One Inside podcast. To take advantage of this offer, simply go to brightervision.com backslash inside. Again, that's brightervision.com backslash inside.